In this first chapter of mobile communications, I will give an introduction to the history of mobile communications, a bit about the markets, number of subscribers, for example, and the areas of research, because there are so many things we still have to explore and to develop. But first of all, why do we all like mobile and wireless communications? So how do the computers for the next decades look like? Think of that. Most of the computers of today are integrated, integrated computers. So these are so-called embedded systems, far more than 90%. These are all these very small, cheap, portable, replaceable, sometimes not replaceable devices. You don't even see them. This is why Mark Weiser, more than 20 years ago, coined the term the invisible computer. So we don't have these separate devices like you have today still. This is a tablet, this is a PC, this is a server. So, But the computers, they will actually disappear. They are integrated into things. Well, that's why we call it the Internet of Things, Internet of everything and everybody. So the technology itself is in the background. So the computers, however they look like, they should be aware of their environment and they should adapt. So they should have a certain, for example, situation awareness, context awareness, location awareness. So the computers recognize, for example, the location and can react appropriately. So you all know this from call forwarding. We will see how, for example, cellular phone systems do this because they actually have to forward a call or forward data. They have to reroute data if you're, for example, on vacation in Australia. We have to forward messages. So maybe the devices today, they already also know the context. If you're in a theater, the phone should not ring. If you're in a meeting, well, that should be in automatic silent mode, for example. Otherwise, it's quite embarrassing. So what else do we have? If we now look 20 years back or 10, 20 years into the future with many, many advanced technology. So we have a lot of computing power in small devices. Think of an intelligent, smart, whatever watch of today has a computing power of a computer, let's say five or 10 years ago of a normal desktop computer. Gigabytes of memory on your palm, that's normal. We don't think about it. The displays are really flat, lightweight, and they have pretty low power consumption. They can be big but also quite small high resolution what is also quite important we need many more new user interfaces think of the size of your fingers and then think of a smart watch maybe it's better to have a voice controlled gadget voice or gesture control something like that what is also quite important is we have more bandwidth per cubic meter what does it mean well, in the early days of mobile communications, wireless communications, we were happy to transmit something like a few kilobit per second. Today, we're talking about hundreds of megabits, gigabits per second over the air. So if you think of the air or the space around us in terms of cubic meters, something like that, or cubic foot, so then you might think of how many bits per second can we transmit? This is then reflected in a bandwidth, etc. We'll come back to this later on. So, but if you compare the system of today, they can really transmit much more data. And then we have so many new wireless interfaces. Think of starting with RFID, near field communications, intelligent text, something like that, Pico networks, Bluetooth, Zigbee, wireless, local area networks, like Wi-Fi, the dot .11, dot .15 standards. We'll also come back to this later on. Wide area networks, like all the cellular networks, but also highly specialized networks like packet radio, Tetra systems, etc. We have many different, more regional, more global wireless uh, telecommunication networks, satellite networks, for example. But then we have also something advanced like visible light communication. Well, advanced, we had this thousands of years ago. The old Greeks already used visible light communications. But visible light communications can easily transmit hundreds of megabits per second. So that's quite interesting. So we'll see in the next decades even more integrated embedded systems 
none of the more conventional user interfaces. So when I'm talking about mobile communication, what does it mean? Well, mobility, we can look at mobility from a user perspective. So I want to be mobile. So that's what I mean by user mobility. So no matter where I am, I want to communicate without any wires. Okay, that's quite obvious. So that means anytime, anywhere with anyone or any device. So I as a user want to be mobile. So that's from a user perspective. But as also the device perspective. So this is where we rather call it device portability. So the devices can be connected anytime, anywhere to the network. What does it mean? Well, we have many different wireless interfaces and no matter where we are, the device should be able to reconnect to whatever network there is. A wireless local area network, wide area cellular system, specialized network, whatever there is. So we will see when we look into the appropriate standards, wireless LANs, Wi-Fi standards, etc., how the devices can actually do this. So why do I distinguish between wireless and mobile? The first chapters mainly cover wireless connectivity. Wireless that has something to do with, well, not wires. So that means electromagnetic waves, signals we transmit. Mobility is a different aspect. Well, mobility of users, mobility, portability of devices. We will see this rather on the higher layers. When you talk about internet, how can the internet support mobility? And if we make the comparison, we even see we can have mobility, but still using wires. So for example, if you reconnect a notebook in a hotel to a fixed network, for example, you want to have a more reliable, higher data rate uh, connectivity, or you have mobile onboard networks. Uh, so you still need some mobility support. We'll come back to this. But it's not a wireless connection. You still have wires, for example, in a car or an airplane. We also have examples of non-mobile fixed wireless lands, for example, historic buildings. You cannot drill a hole through a historic wall, for example. Or you want to replace ad hoc infrastructures. So you set up certain antennas after an earthquake in a disaster area, for example. Then it's not mobile, but you have wireless connectivity. Well, and what we all like, yes, yeah, so is something like the smartphone where you have wireless connections and the device itself is mobile. Well, you as a user are mobile and the device is portable, but usually you have the device with you. So that's more or less one thing, user and device. So this is not really new. So mobile wireless communication exists since many, many years already in the 60s, last century. Uh, research has discussed how can you support more mobility. We'll see when you go back into history, there's already wireless telephony hundreds, hundred years ago. So, okay, so decades ago, several standardization bodies thought of how can we integrate these wireless and mobile networks into the existing networks. It's always a problem if you try to have this something like a clean slate approach where you say, okay, now let's reboot the whole system and let's install a kind of an ideal technical system. Many people tried this, most of them simply failed. So it's quite important to see how can you integrate this new technology, wireless connectivity, mobile devices into existing standards. And for local area networks, I'm sure you're aware of Ethernet, the classical standard, IEEE produces many, many standards. So IEEE 802.11 was one of the first standards there for wireless local area networks. In the internet, the IETF is the important standardization body. And the Internet uh, Engineering Task Force, IETF, came up with many approaches. One of them is mobile IP or mobile IP extensions to the Internet Protocol IP, because the classical protocol IP, the Internet Protocol, cannot really handle mobility, as we will see later on. An example for wide area networks, 
as the integration of the new wireless mobile cell phone system into the existing, at that time, ISDN, the fixed digital telephone network. So, one example for standardization is 3GPP, the third generation partnership project. They do a lot of standardization there. And the nice thing is you can easily look up all the standards of IETF. They are all open. You can easily participate. You can also look up all the standards from 3GPP. Uh, to participate is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the standards of IEEE, they are not open. They will be released to the public, let's say, sometime after they finalize the standardization. So first industry has access to the standards and then the public. Okay, so now let's briefly go through some applications just to give you an idea. I mean, I'm pretty sure you know many, many of the applications. So first of all, well, vehicles. It's quite obvious that you need wireless connections there, wireless transmission, because you cannot have a wire with your car. So uh, if you want to transmit whatever, music, maybe videos, not as driver, but uh, for the kids maybe, uh, news, road conditions, etc. So there are many systems available. There are some broadcast systems for radio, for TV, and uh, for bidirectional communications, LTE. So I will come back to LTE later on. We can use systems for personal communications, positioning, while well, there are different satellite systems like GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, Beidou, so uh, from the US, from Europe, from Russia and from China. Uh, they can be used in cars, for example, but you also have ad hoc networks inside the vehicles. Today, all the cars, they have kind of in-car entertainment, infotainment systems, and you can easily connect your mobile device via Bluetooth, for example, to the car. But also you can create a local, air, local area ad hoc network between cars to prevent accidents, for example. You can transmit a lot of vehicle data. That's pretty common for all the buses and public transports. You can directly see on your smartphone, oh, this or that bus is delayed for example. So our maintenance information, high-speed trains, they transmit since many years their maintenance data so that when they arrive at a certain train station, uh, the crew already knows what's going on with the train. Sure, it's important also to use this for emergencies. You can transmit patient data to hospitals for first diagnosis, etc. You can replace fixed infrastructures. I already mentioned earthquakes, hurricanes, etc. Sure, in crisis or war situations, you cannot have a fixed network. The first thing that is destroyed, either during crisis or after earthquake, is the fixed network infrastructure. So earthquake really actually tears apart the wires, for example. Also mobile phone systems actually have a problem because of the antennas. I will come back to this later. So if you look at this typical application, road traffic, well, it's quite obvious that you have many different wireless technologies. On the left-hand side, more wide area systems like whatever uh, DB+, digital radio, LTE for communication with the cars for emergency situations or just for entertainment. But also inside the car, you have many different technologies like for authentication, maybe near field communication, Bluetooth systems, you use tablets and your mobile phones, maybe even wireless LANs in trains, etc., etc. So there are many different standards and also some maybe some fancy ad hoc networks between the cars. We will go through the majority of the standards. I will explain how they work. We will go into some of the details, not all details, because as you can already see, they are simply too many standards. So looking at these scenarios, what do we as customers really want to have? Well, in the end, I want to have an always best connected mobile and wireless service. I do not care about the technology. I don't want to see the technology. Who's interested in technology? Yes, we are, because we are from computer science, electrical engineering, etc. But Usually people are not interested in technology. It should work. So no matter where I am, 
My, for example, smartphone should be able to receive data via the best available wireless system. So at home, it's a wireless LAN via DSL, for example. If you live on the countryside, it might still be a GSM edge connection. Inside the car, you pair, this is the term, you pair your smartphone with the car and then the car itself is connected to whatever's available. Maybe on a gas station you have a wireless LAN, inside trains you have specialized LTE repeaters, wireless LANs, etc. Also in planes, at, uh, in your office, sure you have way higher data rates, gigabits per second, for example. There are many, many more applications. Think of traveling salespersons, uh, replacement fixed networks, entertainment. Well, that is really, a, well, that was many years ago, already a big push for ad hoc networks. There, well, it's already 20 years ago, several multi-user games with wireless connectivity. So already 20 years ago, you could just jump and run around in a park, uh, hide and seek, etc., with the help of a smartphone. So many applications. So what do we want to have from our mobile and wireless systems? Let's have a look on the services. The nice thing about mobile and wireless systems actually is that the systems know where you are. Knowing where you are offers a real new set of services. So simple location aware services. So for example, if you want to print out something, you just want to type print it and it should appear on the printer close to you. So the phone should know where you are. That So for example, you can find someone or uh, you want to use some servers. Well, maybe you don't want to see that this should be the server closest to you, but the system for performance reasons, yeah, for efficiency reasons. Maybe the system picks the server closest to you when you look up a certain website. You type in the URL, you click on a link, and then the system finds automatically the server closest to you. What does it mean? Proximity in a geographical sense or in a networking minimum hop sense or whatever. We'll come back to this as well. Then we have many follow-on services. So no matter where you are, your workspace space will follow you. So if you whatever, switch on your PC and the desktop or you use your tablet, use your smartphone, no matter where you are, you will have more or less the same look and feel, the same open, closed items, the same last used files view, wherever you are on different devices, follow-on services, call forwarding. So also a very simple follow-on service. Well, not that simple. If you consider billions of devices, high mobility, and then how can the system in the background, the network, whatever it is, how can this network, the network operators, provide the follow-on services? Then quite interesting also, information services. We can distinguish between push and pull services. So push services, Maybe what's happening around me? Is there a disaster going on? So early warning systems, they use push services. They can push an alert to your mobile phone. I will explain how this works. But then there are also pull services where they say, okay, where is the closest, uh, well, the pharmacy? Or where is the next supermarket? Where is the next nice restaurant with at least four stars or whatever. So not Michelin stars, but okay. So these are typical information services. And then inside the network, we need a lot of support services. We need a lot of caching. Without caches, your smartphones, they could not operate in a kind of a smooth manner because sometimes we do not have a wireless connection or only a very, very small data rate, and then suddenly we have hundreds of megabits per second, then back again to kilobit per second. So we need a lot of caching so that the user experience is kind of a smooth experience. 
we can cache intermediate results, state information, etc. And this information can follow the user, well actually the device through the fixed network, because usually fixed networks are way faster, have way more capacity compared to wireless networks. But looking at all these services, do not forget privacy. There are many, many different opinions about privacy, different, well, mindsets, for example, if you compare the US with Europe, China, etc. And it's always a question, who should gain knowledge about the location? Many people think, oh, it's not a good idea if the government knows where I am, <laughs> but they just give away their location data to all the big companies. So the major companies, they know precisely where you are. Your mobile phone will tell them. The mobile phone knows precisely where you are. This is done either via GPS, wireless LAN, fingerprinting, etc., etc. Many different technologies. But so the mobile phone pretty well knows where you are. So uh, it's interesting to see how people hesitate to give away this data to the government. But they give away all this data because they have these nice apps. They are for free. Well, there's no such thing as a free lunch, but we all know this. But so uh, we pay with our data. You should at least be aware of these privacy issues. Now we'll come back looking at the different technologies to these privacy issues again. Okay, this is an overview. So what else do we need? Well, we need devices. We need mobile devices. So ha, you can pretty much think of any type of device. Think of something like a laptop, tablet. Well, this is basically a full featured computer with all the standard applications, normal desktop, machine, laptop. So many people do not own a classical personal computer anymore, but they have a smart, convertible, tablet, whatever. And sometimes you don't want to carry around this heavy device, still 1.5 kilograms. This when you go to a tablet or a larger smartphone, which, well, there you have also more or less the standard applications, maybe a bit simpler versions of the standard applications. You can use tiny virtual keyboards or voice recognition to control the device. If we move further, for example, towards firefighters, the firefighters cannot really use a normal standard tablet. Think of 800 degrees, fire, water, smoke, gloves, big gloves, and then your fingers trying to type or in a very noisy environment trying to tell your tablet something. Usually you use very specialized kind of, uh, the term was coined, I guess 20 years ago, personal digital assistants. So some kind of an assistant with some graphical display, uh, ruggedized, really ruggedized, waterproof, whatever, uh, but still being able to run certain specialized applications. And sometimes you need even smaller devices just for voice or for, for uh, low data rate data, some text messaging. Uh, this is where we, <laughs> back in the, let's say, early 90s with the classical mobile phones, they're still in use. Think of uh, oil rigs, firefighters, ambulance, whatever. Uh, simple to operate, highly reliable. You need networks with 99.9999, so four nines reliability. So, uh, that's really different from, let's say, a classical uh, smartphone we have. If you go to even smaller devices, we are in the field of embedded controllers, internet of tiny little things, sensors, controlling buildings, cars, airplanes, whatever you might think of. And this is really, we have the billions of devices. This is where we have the internet of things many little things connected to the internet. And then also 20 years ago, there was the idea of having smart dust. So back to something that's almost invisible. So dust or small particles 
but can communicate with each other. They're somehow connected to something like the internet via gateway, for example, but they're still mobile and maybe they have some special type of wireless connectivity. So as you see, I cannot give you a clear separation between different device types. So this is a smartphone or this is an embedded uh, PC. No. So there's an increase in performance from left to right, but no clear separation. Okay, so we have many devices. But what does it mean if all these devices are portable? So the effects of device portability, hmm, they are really a problem. Why? <laughs> because all the devices, they need energy. So as soon as your smartphone gets warm, well, you notice it wastes energy. Well, the computation doesn't really need energy, but it's, you know, you accelerate those electrons, they bump into the structure of uh, the metal layer, like copper, silver, whatever there is on the chip, and then this bumping heats up the whole structure of the chip, the chip gets warm, and this is uh, what you feel on the outside of the device. Hmm. So power consumption is a problem. So we always have limited computing power, well, even more limited compared to servers somewhere. Uh, we always have low quality displays. You cannot have a 49 inch display on your tiny little de device. Uh, well, solid state disks will be always smaller compared to servers because we have limited battery capacity. We run the devices out of a battery, lithium polymer battery, for example. And the main problem is well, can easily shown using this simple uh, relation of power consumption to C V square and F. What does it mean? C is the internal capacity of, for example, the chip capacities. Well, if you design a chip, you have many, many little transistors. You can look this up in a book if you're interested in details. But in the end, uh, there is always, for example, a gate that controls the flow of electrons between a source and a train in CMOS technology. But this also creates a capacitor. And in the end, you have to push electrons into the capacitor or let them flow out of the capacitor. So this capacitor stores electrons. And the bigger the capacitor is, the more electrons you can push into it, the more actually energy you store the more you heat up the device, etc. You reduce this by integration, so smaller and smaller and smaller in the nanometer range transistors. Then we have the supply voltage. Well, supply voltage <laughs> is needed to run the whole processor, but there's a certain limit. Why? Go back into the basics of semiconductors, you will learn there's a certain threshold voltage you need to switch a transistor, for example. Let's say 0 0.7 volts, 0. Point whatever volts. So this is the reason why most of the chips today, they run with 1.1, 1.3 volts, something like this. So you cannot reduce this to 0 0.1 or something like this, because then the transistors will not switch anymore. So there's a certain limit. And then there's the clock frequency. Yes, the clock frequency, F equals 0 would be ideal, but then <laughs> the device wouldn't do anything. So you can reduce the clock temporarily. That's exactly what the chips do. You can even switch off parts of the processes if you do not need them. But as soon as you need certain power, well, you have to ramp up the frequency and then you are in the megahertz range, even gigahertz, 1.2, 1.3 gigahertz on a mobile phone. Why? Oh, you want to play something on your mobile phone, then you need a lot of power, high frequency. You need power supply for the graphics processor. Smartphones have specialized graphics processor. And this means you consume a lot of energy, heating up the device, etc. So power consumption, that's key problem, <laughs> because especially, um, well, we have developed newer and faster processes but batteries, yes, they are way better compared to 20, 30 years ago. But still, these are not factors of one or 10 millions like the processors. 
but rather factors of 100 or 1000, so we still have a battery problem. What else do we have? If we have device portability, we can lose data. So you should always keep in mind it, you can lose your mobile phone. You have to think of this when you design these devices. Yes, we all have cloud storage. Hopefully we do not lose the cloud, personal cloud, or so wherever the cloud is. But what happens if you lose your device? Think of your smartphone. How many things do you have actually stored there? Do you really have a backup of all the data, passwords, whatever? Uh, sometimes you don't even know what's all stored on the device. So that's one of the problems. Usually you do not lose your personal computer in your office at home. Then user interface, another problem. There's always a compromise between the size of your fingers. Well, there's a certain limit of your fingers and portability. We like small devices like watches, but we still have thick fingers. So what can we touch there? Not that much. This is why usually we use voice control. We need we well, we use our voice, for example, for SMS. So voice recognition or abstract symbols, icons, that's what we can use on these small devices, but not a real keyboard, for example. All these virtual keyboards, well, yes, you can type something, but just try to use your voice. It's way, way faster. And voice recognition is pretty good. You can even have real-time translation into many different languages. That helps a lot. And then also we have a problem of fast memory. Yes, I know we do have smartphones with gigabytes of memory. We can use micro SD cards. Uh, we have uh, 128, 256, whatever gigabytes of memory, but this is not fast memory. This is flash. Flash is way slower. And uh, so fast mass storage is still a problem. So yes, we do use flash memory. You can switch off your mobile phone. You will not lose data, but still it's not as fast as normal DRAM you have in your computer. DRAMs, we talk about some nanoseconds access time. That's really different if you start an app on a mobile phone compared to an application on a fast computer. So if we compare wireless networks with fixed networks, you should keep in mind there are big differences. Do not just think because oh, we have almost the same data rates. Oh, this is also, we have, oh, let's say, hundreds of megabits per second in my wireless LAN, so this is even faster than my DSL connection to my operator. Uh, but still, there are big, big differences. First of all, you have way higher loss rate. You have interference. Yes, there's also some interference in wires, but if we think of fiber optics, almost no interference. We can have terabits per second of fiber optics with bit error rates 10 to the minus 14, 15. On wireless links, 10 to the minus 2. So that means one out of 100 bits is corrupt. So because all the engines, a lot of well, lightning, but also uh, fluorescent lighting, for example, creates interference, microwave ovens, etc. What else do we have? We have way more regulations. They're more restrictive because the frequencies, they are coordinated worldwide in different regions and even inside a nation. So in most of the useful frequencies, they are occupied. What useful means, I will come back to this in the next chapter. So the problem is you cannot just start your own radio transmitter. It's simply not allowed unless you follow certain rules. If you have a wire, well, you simply connect two devices. You do not have to ask anyone which type of wire you use. Well, if this is green or red or if this is copper wire, if you have golden contacts or whatever, doesn't matter. For frequencies, you cannot simply start your wireless LAN on, let's say, 900 uh, megahertz or 700 megahertz because, oh, this is a nice frequency or I like 450 megahertz. Why not having my wireless LAN with whatever 10 megabits per second on 450 megahertz? You could theoretically do this, but you might run into trouble. Then we will always have lower transmission rates. 
Yes, I know we have gigabits per second, but, but it's always a shared medium. Wireless connections are usually shared connections. That means maybe at midnight, somewhere on the countryside, close to the LTE base station, you will have something like 100 megabit per second. But if you're at noon, downtown, in a shopping area, uh, <laughs> you can be happy that you have several kilobits per second. So coverage is an issue. So it, you really have big difference between maybe countryside, downtown, the daytime, nighttime, etc. Then we always have way higher delays and high chitter. What does it mean? So if you want to set up a connection, let's talk about classical phone calls in GSM. This takes 20 seconds, 15, 10 seconds before the phone rings on the other side. ISDN, a tenth of a second. Way, way faster. Connection setup time. Maybe it's now faster uh, using LTE, but still takes time. Reasons for that, among others, are, well, the algorithms we use for so-called forward error correction. Come back to this when I talk about wireless LANs and LTE and all these telephone standards. Then it's always simpler to attack the wireless networks. Because this is not a wire. Because for a wire you really have to go to the wire, and you have to tap the wire, then you can eavesdrop. But for wireless connection, well, all you need is an antenna somewhere. So it's very, very simple to access the wireless connection. You can even simulate base stations and um, attracting calls from mobile phones, for example. So you have to protect this. But one of the most important things is the shared medium. So the access mechanisms have to be secured. You even have to have different medium access control scenarios. You cannot use this from fixed networks. So keep in mind, wireless networks are different from fixed networks. Okay. Now think of the following questions and do some of the tasks. So please compare the theoretical values for transmission data rates. These are the values operators quite often announce with more realistic data rates. So think of the reasons. Why do you see sometimes a real big difference? And now come back to the difference between fixed and wireless systems. How do they differ in this context? Compare the advances, go to the internet, look up the advances in CPU power, displays, batteries, applications, data rates, etc. So what are the really limiting factors of today? Have a special look on batteries. Then I mentioned three of several organizations that do the standardization of mobile and wireless communications. So please look up IEEE, IETF and 3GPP to get a better understanding how they do the standardization, how many standards there are. You don't have to look into all the standards. Tens of thousands of pages, so that's ooh, unbelievable. But just to get a better feeling, how do they work? And then, for example, think a bit about push and pull services. What are the pros and the cons? So why should I go for a push service? Or why should I go for pull service? What are the disadvantages of push or pull services? What are the advantages?